We're going to read from the book, The Reader's Digest, Mysteries of the Ancient Americas, The New World Before Columbus. Chapter called Ancient Artisans and Master Builders, A Legacy of Beauty. In 1520, the city of Brussels played a host to the world's first display of American art. It was the treasure of Moctezuma, gifts from the Aztec Emperor that Cortes had recently sent home to his sovereign, Charles V. Remember, Charles V was so called Black Man, too. Among the curious visitors was the German artist Albert Dürer. To him, these works of gold, silver, and featherwork were more beautiful to behold than things of which miracles are made. To this diary entry, he added, and I have seen nothing in all my lifelong days which so filled my heart with joy as these things. He was simply astounded by the subtle genius of the New World artisans. For Durer, who was normally reticent and matter-of-fact in his writing, such language was uncommonly effusive. He was clearly fascinated by the sudden appreciation of these objects, as strange looking to him as if they had originated on another planet. At the same time, the expressive power of Aztec art, along with its richness and its superb workmanship, surely excited the artist in him just as these qualities accelerate art lovers today. The art created by the ancient Americans is not only the most beautiful and perhaps most lasting of their accomplishments, it is also among their most awesome achievements. These gifted peoples excelled at every medium they turned their hands to. Excelled, again, excelled. They did everything on point. They produced an infinite variety of exquisite textiles, many of which were superior to those of contemporary old world manufacture. Many, again, were superior to old world manufacture, meaning on the other side of the world, we were superior over here. Many of these things 
the intricacy and delicacy of much of their work in gold, which often requires a magnifying glass to appreciate fully, dazzled and impressed Europeans of the day. The craft of featherwork they developed into high art that is unique to them. In their spacious cities and ceremonial centers, the peoples of pre-conquest America were surrounded by objects of beauty, monumental sculptures of deities and heroes in wood and stone, terracotta and stucco, and hand-sacred precincts. Throughout the Americas, the walls of sanctuaries were bright with murals, celebrating the beneficence of the gods of the legendary feast of warlike princes. Ceremonial equipment such as masks, sacrificial knives, and ritual ceramic vessels provided another outlet for the artist, as did objects of personal adornment. The sartorial language of statues, so important to the ancient American elite, here we find the elaborate ornaments of gold, silver, shell, jade, and other precious stones that so excited the lust of the Spaniards as well as extravagant featherwork and textiles that still amaze us with the richness of their color and technique. Art was also employed in equipping the dead, an industry in itself since many of the loveliest pre-Columbian works seem to have been created expressively for funerary purposes, such as the sumptuous paracas, mummy wrapping that appears on the previous two pages and much of what follows in this picture portfolio. The demands for material for which to create these works of art, supported by a brisk and diverse trade throughout the Western Hemisphere, since Mexico had little natural gold, the mystic goldsmiths there had to obtain it from the south. The Peruvians obtained their turquoise, with which they encrusted their golden vessels from Bolivia. The peoples of Panama, located between the two major cor cores areas of ancient American civilization traded with the Maya in one direction and with the Ecuadorians in the other. And in 1526, while seeking to reach the Inca Empire by sea, the Spaniards made a raft sailing north along the Pacific coast with a cargo of Peruvian pottery and metalware, bound doubt for a trading center in Central America or Mexico. All right, so I just want to show some of the uh, art they have in this uh, book. Very visual book. Look at this. All right, beautiful. All right, the clothing. And then it says down here, it says, This tiny silver Inca doll, costume and textiles and feathers, was found next to the mummified body of a royal child, left to die as a sacrificial victim in the cold, thin air of the Chilean Andes. So this is gold uh, metallic ornaments. Uh, this one, big one right here, showing from the Muisca uh, Indians of Colombia. And then we got a what appears to be like a a ring. It says here by Mexico Supreme Craftsman, the Mistec. All right. So look at that, a gold ring, and this gold ornament right here. artistry and gold all right so just like we just saw and I'm gonna show you a lot of videos and a lot of information I got a lot of videos planned on gold the history here I'm just gonna get a little bit of, of it right here it says sweat of the Sun the Inca called it and indeed for the ancient Americans generally gold was of divine origin suited only for ritual use and personal adornment of the elite all right you hear that even the Spaniards occasionally recognized the beauty of what they were destroying. I do not marvel at gold, wrote Spanish chronicler Peter Martyr, but I am astonished to see workmanship excel substance. How long ago the Indians learned their art remains a mystery, since goldsmith in earliest known appearance in America more than 2,000 years before the conquest finds craftsmen equipped with rude tools already fashioning gold sheet ornaments with astonishing skill. Later, some also learned the art of casting by the lost wax method, a technique widely known in the old world. In this process, the image is first modeled in wax and enveloped in a clay and charcoal mold. The mold is fired, the melted wax runs out, and molten gold is poured in, 
to create a perfect replica of the lost wax original, the Renaissance goldsmith Benvenuto Cellini is said to have admitted bafflement over a flexible little fish from America, part silver, part gold. The fish is long gone, but the few pieces that survive reflect a lost splendor of the goldsmith's art. And uh, here, just got another example here. This is again gold. And above the one we saw here is a Muisca feline gold, an offering for the sacred lake. The Kimbaya of Colombia are famed for their Tumbaga gold flask, hollow castings with buttery surfaces and monumental trance-like figures and relief. And then we got this big one right here, all right? this person look at the person a lot, almost look like the buddha set missing you know the little curly hair <laughs> all right and it says that that one is the one at left more than 1000 years old once held lime which was shooed with the narcotic coca leaf and right here we got a golden breastplate as you can see that's a golden breastplate look at that Look at the symbol right here. It says the mystic breast ornament above a fabulous 1932 discovery at Monte Alban is a triumph of lost, lost wax casting. The god's headdress was laid out in threads of wax, each replaced during casting by the flux of molten, molten gold. Another tour de force is the Aztec serpent head lip plug at left. It was a movable tongue. All right, you see this? The tongue moves and it doesn't come off. That's all gold. Look at that. Wow. So you see what they were doing, right? Real advanced metal work of gold, goldsmithing, right? Prehistoric Man in America by Dean Harris. Reprinted from Archaeological Reports page 65 of this book and it says here prehistoric civilization of america in the ruins of the pre-columbian cities of yucatan and central america we see the most elaborate forms of sculpture adorning the altars idols and buildings the remains of people skilled in architecture sculpture and drawing and beyond doubt excelling in arts that have perished all right excelling in arts nobody else can match these sculptured monoliths altars and statues are not rude and archaic and many of the halls yet standing are arabesque fashion listen to this again arabesques fashion and mosaic and in grekis or greek and an arab style you hear what they're saying and delicate tracery not unworthy of a place in modern decorative art. The pillars and stone tablets, which carry hieroglyphics, are remarkably well executed. These hieroglyphics or secret writings were executed in characters known only to the priest and learned men of the race. We have not as yet been able to decipher them, right? They hadn't been deciphered yet. They wrote this. They still haven't. They're making it all up so that the characters on the monuments of Copan, Palenque, and Mayapan furnish us no data or information. The Maya system of symbolic writing appears to be a species of mnemonics. The hierographs on the Palenque tablets, now in the National Museum, Mexico City, are in perpendicular row, and for out we know the characters may be alphabetic any written language. On these tablets, we perceived a highly artificial system of writing, and to interpret it, the Aztec or Mexican picture writing affords us no help. The architecture and system of writing of these prehistoric peoples are different from those of any other known race, ancient or modern. Okay? They are of a new order and are entirely and absolutely anomalous. They stand alone. The cultivation and refinement, such as it was, was not derived from the old world. We got it from us. We This is the old world. 
without models or masters from abroad their architecture originated amongst themselves amongst themselves listen they were a distinct people having an existence independent of asia europe or africa or africa apparently indigenous like the animals indigenous like the animals are you guys paying attention you've been here plants and fruits of the soil so just like the animals the plants and the soil you are indigenous too to this part of the world not just those other continents they want to say everybody came to america like there was nobody over here the Reader's Digest, Mysteries of the Ancient Americas, The New World Before Columbus, a chapter called Ancient Artisans and Master Builders. And then look at this uh, cup or chalice or <laughs> offering glass, whatever, you know, they want to interpret it as, I guess. Look at the designs they have in Mitla. We saw that. And you can find this in um, Lake Titicaca. Right, and that frame door that leads to nowhere, that gate, you can see the same symbol. There, the same guy right in the middle. It says turquoise inlay enriched much of the gold work of the pre Inca civilization of northern Peru. Three magnificent examples of this on this page include a bird shaped ritual vessel, that's what we just saw, an embossed beaker with the image of a god above, and a figurine of similar design, right, with an open work headdress that forms the handle of a ceremonial knife all right so let's take a look at that wow look at that handle of a ceremonial life wow and then bird right here a known way with alloys and precious stones archaeologists believe that pre-columbian gold working got its start in peru and spread north to mexico where it culminated in the exquisite jewelry of the mystic shortly before the conquest. Each region along the way, a distinctive specialty. Among the Peruvians who favored broad expanses of gold, the tradition of sheet metalwork continued, enhanced by cool accents of inlaid turquoise. Other craftsmen mixed gold with copper to create the alloy tumbaga, which has a lower melting point. They made it look like gold by removing the surface copper with acid, leaving a film of pure gold. In Ecuador, metalsmiths even learned to work to work platinum, whose high melting points was beyond the range of their simple furnaces. They did this by powdering gold and blending it with grains of platinum, a technique called sintering, which was mastered by Europeans only in the 19th century. All right, 1800s, that's when they started doing it. And the ancient Americans were doing it already. Hey, okay, we got a cool little mask right here. Check this out. That's what I think it is, a mask. We're going to read what it mean. It, it is. Look at the eyes, the shape of the eyes. Just want you guys to know it. It says the Lambayaki burial mask above, 19 and a half inches wide, is of embossed sheet gold. The nose is separated piece attached with gold staples, as are the danglers over mouth and ears. The mask covered the face of a mummy and was painted red. The sacred funerary color in ancient America. The spectacular gold and silver nose ornament below, adorned with fox heads and shells of gold, was made in Peru before AD 300. It is eight and a half inches wide and was held in a place by the clip at center. Right, so that's the image below right here. Wow, look at that. Dracon, what's that? Two dracons, what's that? Look at that jewelry, wow. That gold chain. Jade, sacred, powerful, more valued than gold. Much as they appreciated gold, the substance priced above all others in pre-Columbian Mesoamerica was jade. With its subtle and varied ocean hues, ranging from deep blue green to translucent emerald jade was sacred held to possess life-given powers it was also a status symbol especially among the olmec and later the maya who festooned their elaborate costumes with jade beads and even inlaid their teeth with jade again 
even inlaid their teeth with jade grills jade grills okay jade is an extremely hard stone yet the ancient craftsmen handled the refractory material with deceptive ease using only simple hand tools to saw slices of the jade boulders they discovered in the mountains they used flat pieces of wood or raw hide coated with quartz sand or other abrasives the groove surfaces with curved lines as on the serpent head plaque below they first drilled a series of shallow close set holes with fine hand twirled wooden drills dipped in abrasive then rubbed down the ridges in between to cut circular patterns or bore a hole clear through they used various sizes of bamboo drills the effort required immense labor as well as skill but it resulted in some of the most exquisite creations of the lapidary's art. So here's a piece they're talking about, and I've shown this uh, artifact in uh, my Wakanda Black Panther video. This is a wear jaguar. This is a human, half human, half jaguar, wear jaguar. Says all my craftsmen 3,000 years ago were creating powerful images of jade. The ceremonial axe head at right is characteristic combination of the features of a jaguar and a crying baby, they say. <laughs> the long-beaked bird pendant at left, not quite three inches high, was made in Costa Rica more than 1,000 years ago. This is made here. Some of my ancient ancestors. The bird is more than it seems it has human hands clasped on his breast and is perched all right look at that human hands toucan it almost look like doth right with the green uh oh <laughs> and it's perched on a tiny human's call the maya plague above this one right here carved with the emblem of the feather serpent is among the many treasures dressed early this century from chichen itza sacred well of sacrifice we got some more right here. Look at the jade sculpture. Wow, look at the person. What's that? Dreadlocks? You tell me. And then, wow, look at this. This is right on the jade rock. Wow. And then this. You already know. The jade sculpture on this page shows the range and versatility of the Maya skilled gem cutters. The remarkable head at top is so lifelike that it could well be the portrait of an actual person. Look at that. It is an actual person. A Naga, an ancient Maya Khan. The grandee above strikes a pose often met with a Maya art. The plaque's irregular shape suggests that it is a fragment of a larger piece. The celt or ceremonial axe at right was incised with a tubular drill coated with jade and to create the elegant figure of a Maya ruler. The red color is later addition. Prehistoric Man in America by Dean Harris. No analogies of art connect the ancient civilization of America with that of any known people. In their art, they copied nature. Not Egyptians, not Assyrians, not Babylonians, not so-called Moors, but they copied nature. In their art, they copied nature. And at Uxmal in Yucatan and Copan in Honduras, we gaze upon buildings not unworthy to stand side by side with the best examples of ancient Egypt and Assyria. Just like over there. Just like it. Just as great. Just as great. These primitives but where is the real ancient Egypt? That's why. These primitive Americans were skilled in medicine and surgery. The notes sur la medicine et la botanique des ancient Mexicans, published in book form lately by the Vatican Polyglot Press, contains many items of information that must surprise those who think that only in recent times have we made valuable discoveries in therapeutics and that all serious investigation in medicine or whatever has been done in surgery has been accomplished by European methods and by the men of Europe. Among the Mayas of Yucatan and the people who antedated the Toltecs in Mexico, 
doctors were constituted a distinct and separate body of men. All right, that's deep right there. They formed a class by themselves, and the sons inherited the profession of the fathers. They made use of a multitude of drugs and were familiar with diuretics, emetics, dietetics, febrifuges, emollients, and vermifuges. They had many medicaments for all forms of indisposition. They administered their medicine in many different ways, as decoctions, infusions, oils, ointments, and plasters. Certain gums and resins they applied as electuaries. They recommended vapor baths and varied the treatment to suit the disease or the individual patient. All right, you hear all this? Medicine, this healing, natural healing that was going on over here. The historian de Anguiera states that in his own time, 1524, when European physicians in Mexico failed to cure their Spanish patients, the native doctors were sometimes sent for and often effected a cure. You hear that? The Spaniards were dying, a lot of them, and they didn't have cures in Spain for them. And when they got here, the Indian indigenous people were curing them. Even as late as the days of conquest, when Maya and Aztec civilization had greatly declined, Cortez and his men were successfully treated by native doctors for illness and wounds. And again, I want to remind everybody that these Spaniards, Cortez, all these people were Sephardic Jews and Moors. These were people of color too, all right? Just like the indigenous people. Cortez was so convinced of their skill that he wrote to the Spanish court asking that no physician of Spain be allowed to come to the colony. These native physicians anticipated modern advances for they made use of the seeds of certain plants for anesthesia and a distilled spirit for lessening the painfulness of operation. Last August, Professor Marshall Seville of Columbia University, New York City, returned from two months excavations in Esmeraldas, Ecuador. He brought back with him skulls of South American men who lived 500 years before the discovery of America. The teeth in the jaws were filled with an alloy and crowned with metallic caps. Listen to this. In all cases, he assures us the workmanship is almost the equal of the modern dentist art. Dentist art, grills, are we talking about grill? what? Sahagun, who studied their system of medicine very carefully, hence even of antiseptics. It was not alone in the use of drugs, however, that these doctors were skilled. When the Spaniards landed at Veracruz in 1519, native botany was in advance of that of the old world. Several centuries later, the genius of Linaos enabled him to substitute for long descriptions of plants, a concise designation, a generic name, and a specific classification. But many centuries before the time of the great botanist, these ancient scientists, again, these ancient scientists had something resembling it and possessed a botanical nomenclature of their own. All right. Again, these were not savages. These weren't savage people. Their classification was superior to that of Europe, superior to that of Europe before the birth of Linaus. They had traced the influence of temperature and elevation upon plants and shrubs and to some extent had systematized their knowledge. Through their botanical knowledge, compared with our own, was imperfect. We nevertheless have abundant evidence that they advanced far on the road to mastering the science of botany. The Department of American Antiquities and National Museum, Mexico City, is the most notable in the world and is a veritable treasure house of pre-Columbian relics and prehistoric finds in parentheses because a lot of those finds are actually people stealing stuff right and they call them finds these archaeologists are stealing stuff right in one room of the department are exhibited examples of famous Aztec picture writings and Aztec maps and drawings of Tenochtitlan now the city of Mexico Tinoc Enoch do you see the name Enoch in the word Tinoctitlan, Enoch, check out my top video. 
Here also are arms, jewels, glaze, pottery, and cloth made from the fibers of Heneguan, agave, and the maguey plant. Beautiful specimens of feather cloth woven from extremely delicate tissues of cotton. Again, cotton combined with feather and rabbit's fur. Polished crystals, obsidian, or volcanic glass manufactured into delicate objects of ornamental or economic value. Figures of gold and silver, exquisitely wrought, and filagree ornaments of beautiful design fill many cases in the museum. The Reader's Digest, Mysteries of the Ancient Americas, The New World Before Columbus, chapter called Ancient Artisans and Master Builders, Genius of Peru's Weavers, Ancient Andean Textiles, became world famous after a sensational discovery in 1925 on Peru's arid Paracas Peninsula. A 2,000-year-old burial ground yielded 429 mummies, some wrapped in layers of cotton interspersed with fabulously embroidered cloth. The brilliant colors of the shrouds were perfectly preserved in tombs insulated from the desert sun, minutely stitched in complex patterns each must have taken years to produce, only to be hidden away in a grave. Virtuoso spinners, dyers, and weavers, ancient Peruvian craftsmen, practice every kind of fabric construction known today. Indeed, some of their techniques are too time-consuming to be used now, including the making of double and triple cloths and a unique method of interlocking tapestry construction for a more even surface. Tapestry weaving was a specialty. They used up to 500 threads per inch as against 85 in the best Renaissance work. No wonder the Spaniards mistook the finer Inca cottons for silk and recruited Indian weavers to create banners and church hangings. All right, so here's just one example right here. They're talking about, let me get the art inside too. All right, it's done by weavers. It says here the border left of a cotton mantle from Paracas, embroidered with a alpaca wool, shows stylized images of monkeys and tiny human and animal motives. The richly colored headband above is from Nazca. Farther south on Peru's coast is a piece of triple cloth, a challenge for weavers. All right, this is talking about this right here. So look at this. Look at this in art right here. Wow. Wow, it's like those robes. It's beautiful, right? So nice, bright colors. And of course, the fringes, right? The fringes at the end, the fringes. Come on now. All right, we got another one right here. Look at this. Let me back up a little bit. All right. It says, a cat inside a cat inside a cat? Or is it a bird deity? Such ambiguous creatures are typical in Paracas embroideries. So is the uncertainty as to the figure's meaning. Equally puzzling is the whimsical fruit tree made of cloth below. With a human figure in its branches, it comes from a tomb in Chancay, farther up the coast. A four-pointed warry hat below right from central Peru is a fine specimen of tapestry and dates from before AD 1000. All right, so look at that, a cat inside a cat or a bird diary. Society. It's holding humans here, and then we got this. Wow, look at this. Wow. You got the chest face, man, or bird. <laughs> and then we got this right here a hat, right? Little hoodie hat. And pay close attention to the shape of this hat. Magnificent creations of fragile featherwork. The magnificent headdress of iridescent green shown below and the shield opposite may be the only survivors from the sumptuous treasures that Cortes sent to Spain's sovereign. The headdress made of the tail feathers of the rare, greatly coveted Quetzal bird sketched opposite is a stunning specimen of Aztec featherwork 
such creations were strictly for the elite and achieved a high level of refinement. In battle array, chieftains cut splendid figures in their multi-hued featherwork suits. Hangings, resplendent with images of birds, flowers, and insects, glowed on the walls of Moctezuma's palace. In that instance, the feathers came from royal av aviaries, where 300 attendants took care of a vast collection of birds whose bright plumage was converted into featherwork. So the Spaniards reported by Moctezuma's wives and concubines, because of its fragility, very little of this art has survived. That the royal headdress did so is a small miracle. For generations after the conquest, it belonged to the Dukes of Tyrol, whose children are said to have worn it at costume parties. They were playing around with it. Only in the past century did it find a safe haven in a Vienna museum. I'm going to show you guys what they're talking about. All right. And this is what they're talking about. Look how beautiful this is from the Quetzal bird, the Quetzal feather. All right. A lot of you know the stories behind this. Uh, you know. Four feet high, the plumes of Moctezuma's headdress are woven into cloth and are set off by a brilliant blue fringe of Cotinga feathers and by bands of tiny gold plaques. The headdress once sported a golden bird's head mounted in the center. All right, that's gone. Let's hear another famed relic in Vienna is an Aztec feather mosaic shield with the coyote like water monster Ajuizol outlined in gold. Below are two outstanding works from Peru. Left, a ceremonial tunic glows with tropical colors, right? Featherwork ear spools mounted on lightweight wood require the eye and hand of master jeweler and layering tears of the tiniest feathers to create the lovely frieze of birds around them, around the rim. Look at that. Look at the feathers. Wow. With the cloth. This is, this is dope. Rare masterpieces and perishable wood. When we think of early American sculpture, we seldom think of wood, since little remains of the artworks made in this perishable medium. Yet wood was widely used wherever there were forests. Finely carved wooden lint lintels were often incorporated into stone temples and wooden images of gods and men adorned cities and sanctuaries. Wood carving was probably a flourishing tradition for many centuries before artisans plucked up their courage to attack solid stone with their simple tools. The shape of certain pre-Columbian stone structures seems to point to a heritage from wood. One authority on the Olmec surmises that their stonework developed out of wood carvings, adding that it is possible the Olmec would have fashioned wooden steels ak akin to the totem poles of the Pacific Northwest coast. Indeed, wooden objects provide the few artistic links between the high civilization of Mesoamerica and the less complex societies of the Southeast. Today, only a handful of masterpieces survives to recall a lost art. All right, we're going to look at one of these wooden pieces right now. Uh, you see here, that's like the headdress. That's a person right here. Look at the person. Got his adornments and clothing. Carrying his little seed bag, right? Just like the little bag that the Babylonian god supposedly got, right? And then right here, what do we have right here? Look at this. Again, this is made out of wood. Okay, these things perish, you know, with the rain and all that, so it's harder to preserve. So here, the carved painted board on left from the South Peruvian coast has human figures on top and birds down one side. Such ornate boards have been found next to mummies and Inca per period tombs. The regal Maya figure above is 22 inches high and made of a tough sapote wood. It's more than 1,000 years old. And this right here says the life-size Maya funeral mask at right, showing traces of an original paint once covered the face of a buried ruler. An idealized portrait, the mask is also meant to reflect the dignitary's divine attributes. As in all such funeral masks, the eyes are sealed. 
All right, so look at this. This is again made out of wood. And we got like a little cat figurine here. Looks almost like the Egyptian ones. You see that? It says an unusual North American artifact. This expressive hardwood panther from Key Marco, Florida. This is from Florida. All right, let me zoom into that so you guys can see. You see that? This is from Florida. Wooden figurine from Florida was found preserved underwater. The product of a culture dating back at least 1,000 years. The Aztec drum at right in the image of an owl's head is splotted to produce different notes when struck with rubber tip sticks. All right, and this is what they're talking about. Mosaic, a miniaturist art. For the ancient Greeks and Romans, mosaics were designed to be spread across such large surfaces as walls and floors. For the early Americans, by contrast, mosaic was a way of decorating small portable objects such as, as masks, mirrors, pendants, and ear ornaments. Mosaic was a miniaturist art, a jeweler's art, and the materials used were accordingly rare and precious. Turquoise, jadeite, obsidian, malachite, lignite, Pyrite, garnet, beryl, lapis, lazuli, mother of pearl, and seashells in a rainbow of colors. Each tiny ship was painstakingly shaped to fit alongside its neighbors, and glued to back in that was usually of wood. Here again, the ancient artisans dramatically display their familiar qualities of limitless patience, combined with unwavering standards of craftsmanship. Mosaic was a Mesoamerican specialty. Again, mosaic was a Mesoamerican specialty and the mystics were the most accomplished mosaicist of all. One mystic ceremonial shield, less than a foot in diameter, is estimated to contain more than 14,000 chips, each separately cut and fitted. Unfortunately, only a few of these fragile jewel-like works have survived and mostly by virtue of having been sent home by the Spaniards as souvenirs. All right, so let me just show you. This is one image they're talking about here. All right, check this out. Cool. A lot of different colors. All right, and it goes down. You see this? Wow. It says, this image at left of a man's head inside a wild boar's jaws was perhaps meant to convey the ferocity of Mexico's warlike Toltec. So they're talking about this right here and look at that the intricate mother of pearls inlay is less than six inches high the heavily restored mirror back above displays an elegant design in turquoise pirate and mother of pearl dated back ad 1000 it comes from peru all right you heard that this is a mirror <laughs> this here the sinuous double-headed serpent at left was made by mexico's renowned mystic craftsman a century or so before the conquest a mosaic in turquoise and shell laid over a hollow wood the breast ornament is 17 inches wide and that's dope look at that we got some more examples here this looks like a crystal look at that crystal knife with the mosaic handle oh that's beautiful i would love to have this right here all right and this is a mask right look at that mosaic mask of jade it's beautiful stuff here guys it says here the mosaic burial mask at left was fitted together out of a hundred of tiny pieces of turquoise by mystic craftsmen for their aztec employers eyes and teeth are of shell the crouching man knife all right handle above is also mystic work such ceremonial knives may have been used in human sacrifice all right so he's making all that up it could just be a knife <laughs> to cut things. And that's a dope knife. Look at that. Wow. Recording the past in picture books. Among the most remarkable works in the legacy of the ancient Mesoamericans are the codices, books of deerskin or bark paper made to open and close like folding screens. At some time, there were hundreds of these rich displays of hieroglyphs and minutely detailed pictures only 16 traditional codices survive. 
a few in fragmentary form. Some codices, notably those produced by mystic artists, are picture histories of ancestral rulers. Other codices are less easily defined. They may describe the geography of a region, establishing the territorial claims of the ruling class, depict mythological events, or set forth the calendars of religious ceremonies. Most likely the codices were made for the use of priests and rulers. Clearly they are instructional, because everything in them has been subordinated to the aim of recording and conveying information. This is one source of their charm. Aztec scribes continued to make codices after the conquest and these, with Spanish captions alongside the native symbols, have become source books of ancient Mesoamerican history. All right, so this is one of the codices they're talking about here. I just want you guys to take a look at the images here and these codices. You see what they're talking about. I want to read a little bit what it says here. It says, the facsimile of the post-conquest mystic codex below is open to display four of its 52 pages, designed to be read from right to left. The page at far right shows how the world's original chaos was put into sacred order, thus setting the stage for civilized life. Divine spirits are depicted performing the necessary rituals in front of dwellings and mountain peaks, one of which sports the face of the rain god. The other pages catalog actual mystic place names, towns, hills, rivers, etc., which may have just gained their identities through supernatural dispensation. On the left-hand page, column 2 at top, the blue through with a female standing in it, represents a specific river. Farther down, the two-quartered circles stand for two actual marketplaces. All right, so just again, giving an example here of what they're talking about. All right, you see that? Who's in there? You see that? Who's in there? All right, and these are some more. We've run into these a lot. You know, I've shown this a lot. The Quetzalcoatl, this is Quetzalcoatl with the cardinal points, right? The cross, carrying the cross. Who Quetzalcoatl? The four cardinal points. X marks the spot, the ley lines, the connection where they meet and some more right here examples drama and glowing colors by unknown masters European art lovers in the 1880s were overwhelmed by their first glimpse of Nazca slip painted pottery the Nazca pots the lustrous surfaces glowing with many different colors helped bring about a new appreciation of pre-Columbian art Maya paintings have had perhaps an equal impact, even on an object as unpretentious as the clay jar below. The lively rhythm of the figures, their easy naturalness, and the bravura rendering of costumes and glyphs reveal a stunning sophistication on the part of Maya painters 10 centuries ago. The biggest revelation has been the great Maya murals. The one opposite, discovered at Cascatla in 1975, may record an actual event a violent battle scene with elaborate accounted warriors locked in furious combat. Cacastla is in the Mexican highlands, far from Maya territory, and the style, although predominantly Maya, is blended with influences from other cultures. Even so, the richness of the composition, the grandeur of the individual figures, and not least the magnificence of the color place, these murals among the world masterpieces of ancient art. A luminous Nazca effigy jar displays the South Peruvian ability to produce vibrant color. The two-foot-high vessel portrays the god of water. At center is an otter with streams of water issuing from its mouth. Trophy heads decorate the base. All right, again, that's the jar. Beautiful. As you guys can see, as you, you already know, copper colored. He got his little hat on and everything. And then we got Maya vases here. You know, that's what it looks like. All copper colored uh, dancers or warriors. They, look at them, they got hats. Look at their hats. Let me zoom in. I want you guys to see that. Look at his hat. 
Look at this person's hat. He got a deer in his, as his hat, or he's just carrying him. <laughs> Next, we got this beautiful piece right here. Seen this many times on the internet. We're going to get the source of it right now. Beautiful piece. Beautiful piece right here. All right. You already know. That's an ancient Maya. Khan. Naga. Mesoamerican. And you see. You got. All this. Look at the Quetzal bird. The Drakon. The Quetzalcoatl in the bottom. He's riding. He got the wings. Everything. Beautiful art piece. All right. I'm going to ask you, son. I always ask you, do you remember who you are? <laughs> Let's go back, all right? And we're going to get the description. There's another one right here. All right, take a look. All right, you see that? Copper colored tribes of America. There's headband, some feathers, the shield, this harpoon. They said they didn't have those here, spears. We got those here. I told you. The Jaguar pelt. It says here in the recently discovered Kakasla murals, three details of which are shown on this page warriors in Jaguar costumes, perhaps represented a highland tribe, fight against warriors in eagle costume, possibly lowland invaders. At top, an imposing eagle warrior stands guard. All right, an eagle warrior. That's who this guy is. Look at that eagle warrior his talon feet on a feathered serpent above a jaguar defender turns to the attack to help with the final victory at right a border features realistic marine creatures a typical highland motive all right so jaguar warrior here and an eagle warrior copper colored both of them as you guys can see i'm gonna ask you one more time do you remember who you are Sculptors in clay, bridging the centuries. Some of the greatest artists of the ancient Americas worked in clay. The challenge of firing hollow clay figures, sometimes life-size, without cracking them in the kiln, called for technical skill of a high order. The finished works are amazingly vital and expressive, whether rigid, stylized images from Western Mexico below or realistic portraits from Peru far right vast quantities of clay sculptures were produced in every period and since clay is durable and the spaniards had no interest in the object themselves a great number have survived all right so let's go to some of the images real quick all right let me back up and i just want to show you all right so these people's phenotypes you see his eyes so different phenotypes here in ancient america and Look at how it's sitting. It says here, a 2,000-year-old painted Najarit figurine on the left from Western Mexico has slanted eyes. Slanted eyes. In her oversized head, a feature that has earned such figures the name Chinesca. The Chinese one. All right? The Chinese one. The curious figurine above found in Guatemala has a front that detaches to reveal tiny figures within its hollow body. It may be the work of Teotihuacan artist AD 500. What it represents is a total mystery. All right, so even though they're calling these people the Chinese one because of the slanted eyes, it is 2,000 years old. So then you would have to be saying, oh, Asians came 2,000 years old. You... So I would say there's a lot of conjecture saying that they are Asian just because of the eyes. They could have came out of here and went into Asia, right? That look, you know, but we had every phenotype. Here, a Peruvian ritual vessel left heavily restored shows a seated god or chieftain being served by women and shaded by a canopy held high by retainers. It is dated prior to AD 800. A formidable lady below left from Veracruz, 7th century AD, gives useful clues to women's customs in ancient Mexico. The handsome stirrup spout jug from Peru below. Perhaps 1,500 years old is one of the famous Moshe portrait head vessels, which are thought to picture actual 
individuals. Okay, so they're talking about this. That's an actual individual. You see that? That's somebody real. Of the colored tribes of America. Moshe. And look at this person right here. All right. <laughs> Clothing. And then they were talking about this, the seated, being served by women and stuff. Seated chieftain. Again, this is all out of clay. Sculptures in stone, creating a pantheon. Stone sculpture brings us close to the religious world of the ancient Americans. Figures like those shown here did not just portray deities. They were imbued with a divine power of their own. The Spaniards, understanding this only too well, destroyed or buried every statue they laid hands on. Even then, they were never certain that the old idols had lost their potency. Idols. As late as 1823, when the authorities allowed the gigantic earth god, this Cuatlicu, far right, to be exhumed to make a plaster cast, they quickly reburied her so as not to arouse the peasants. Today, the excitement is more apt to be aesthetic rather than religious. Right, so this is what they're talking about right here, the statue of the goddess. All right, you see? The goddess. Stone figures and Aztec water goddess left basalt adopts the same kneeling posture that Mexican Indian woman long did in the churches of their new religion. From Guatemala's highlands comes an acrobatic little figure above, balancing a hemispherical object on the soles of his feet. The same object appears in other small carvings of the region. Most likely, archaeologists believe it represents a mushroom cap and the image is a ritual object of a hallucinogenic cult. All right, you see that? The mushroom right here. The gifted craftsmen often chose the hardest stone to work with, yet their creations are all of the more forceful because of the restrictions imposed by simple tools. Mexican sculpture, said the modern sculptor Henry Moore, seems to me to be true and right. It's stoniness, by which I mean it's truth to material. It's tremendous power without loss of sensitiveness. Make it unsurpassed, in my opinion, by any other period of stone culture. All right? Unsurpassed. All right, so we got some more here. Stone sculptures. As you can see here. And on the right, right here. We got like a wolf or dog it says the sensitively carved head at top left, possibly the Maya Maiz God, was once attached to a temple at Copan, Honduras. The appealing little dog lifting its muscle to the moon left is not what it seems. It is the Aztec's mythical dog-like water creature sculpted in volcanic stone. The horrific figure of the earth goddess Cuaticlu, above eight and a half feet tall, once stood in a temple in the Aztec capital, Tenochtitlan. She has two rattlesnake heads where her human head showed should be, a necklace of human hearts and chopped off hands with a skull for a centerpiece. All right. Prehistoric Man in America by Dean Harris. You hear all the stuff they stole, all the beautiful things the indigenous people here had. They were living and they were dressing luxuriously. Anthropologists such as the Orbigny, the Burbuk, and Heinrich Schliemann are of the opinion that the region now known as Yucatan, Chiapas, and Tabasco was the cradle land of primitive American civilization. From this land went out in the very remote past colonies into South and Central America, carrying with them the arts of civilized men. From here also detached bodies went into Mexico and the Northlands where they built Mitla in other cities, the wonderful ruins of which excite our astonishment at, and admiration. In these lands we find the tidal remains of an ancient race, which welled up from its primal springs in Yucatan, and the dense overflowed, multiplied, and rolled on over the entire continent. As the overflowing population rolled far away from its origin and its source, its lost the best part of its civilization. It lost its social strength, its historic memories, arts, traditions, crafts, 
and in some instances, almost the very means and methods of subsistence. And I would add that they also forgot who they were, the best part of them. A lot of these people that he's saying went out of Central America. A lot of these Central American tribes in Mexico, Guatemala, and all these places ended up in North America later on, combining with the North American tribes, you know, and creating, you know, other tribes up there. In time, the womb of primitive civilization itself became gangrened, and when Cortez entered Mexico and Grijalva landed in Yucatan, they found the Aztec and Maya civilization decaying, disintegrating, and decomposing. Some of the sculpture statues are of a heroic dimensions. The curiously designed figures, the unfamiliar carvings on the altars, and the panel work on the inner walls of Palenque or Mitla are not surpassed by the temple specimens of Egypt and Assyria. An exhibition in Paris and London. All right, so these things do not surpass what you're finding in Mitla. This is just one example of what they're talking about. This is a wall. A wall. This is a stone wall, right? And Mitla, inner wall of temple and Mitla. All right, so this is beauty, art, right? That stuff in Egypt and Assyria does not surpass it. Mournfully beautiful are the ruins of the prehistoric city of Copan, surrounded by a forest painful in the intensity and duration of its silence. It is a phantom in the wilderness, and when we demand of it to tell us how many centuries have passed away since the quarry was opened for the, these stones, how long since the builders began the city, how long was the city inhabited, and when was the city deserted, there comes no answer to our questionings. If as it is now conceded by students of Central American history, the Quiches preceded the Mayas, and another race, antedating the Mayas, built the cities whose ruin now exists all over Central America, Yucatan, and Mexico. What assurance have we that many civilized communities did not successively appear, run their course, and perish in the veiled ages of prehistoric times. And I agree on that. What I want to point out, what he's saying here is that, yeah, a lot of different people lived in the same location for ages, right? They had different epics there. You know, one empire will come, another people will come, move in, move out. And this is way before Europeans came, right? So don't always group people living in one region as like they were there, you know, millions of years old but they could have you know migrated out been invaded by other indigenous peoples you know as he's saying here and perish in the veiled ages of prehistoric times and by prehistoric times i mean the ages between the creation of man and the beginning of authentic history under the limitations of our information and knowledge we are free to assume that the quiches Mayas, Yucatecas, and the Indians now in Central America and Yucatan were and are the descendants of the civilized people who built the cities now abandoned. In order to account for the magnitude and splendor of the temples and public buildings of these cities, a centralized form of government must have existed. Centralized government. These immense buildings could have been erected only by the expenditure of great labor probably slave labor, and under a highly organized system of superintendents. Possibly the government was an imperial autocracy, or it may have been like that of Greece, which was in religion and language one nation, though politically a confederacy of sovereign states. Who may deny that the savage of poor barbarian tribes who roamed the plains or peopled the forests of North America in the memory of man yet living were not scattered fragments from the wreck of this civilization that in remote ages was lost in lurid storms of war or disappeared under adverse conditions which then as in our own times made and make for decay of national unity national virtue and character defining in particular the social and the family state and condition of american indians with reference to the knowledge we have acquired of them, we know that the same fortunes have followed the migrations of the dispersed and scattered race. When human beings become destitute and desperate, conditions of life make them so, 
barbarism and savagery will, in time, overtake them. When driven by the fortunes of war, or under the dire pressure of famine, from its own land, the flying remnant gradually separated from the civilization it carries from its home. It lost its culture, just as we would lose it now with all our refinement if we were forced to live their lives and were subject to the same conditions and hardships. The Reader's Digest, Mysteries of the Ancient Americas, The New World Before Columbus, continuing with the ancient artisans and master builders. It says here, a testament in stone. We lived in the ruined palace of their kings. We went up to their desolate temples and fallen altars. So recalled John Lloyd Stevens, an American lawyer who plunged into the Mesoamerican forest in 1839 to begin exploring the great Maya ceremonial centers that so caught the imagination of his age. Uxmal Copan, Chichen Itza, Palenque, though glimpsed by the occasional curious traveler, over the centuries they had all been neglected. Time and the luxuriant growth of the subtropics had entombed their colossal structures, but succeeding years were to see increasingly fervent probes into the pre-Columbian past, ranging from the scholarly to the lacenius discovery, rediscovery, and disinterment of ancient centers accelerated in virtually all parts of the Americas were remnants of stone monuments yielded increasingly impressive testimony to the skills of the vanished master builders. Master builders. Throughout the highland valleys and subtropical lowlands of Mexico and Central America, more and more centers of the Toltec, Mystic, and Maya were located and researched. In Ecuador, Colombia, and Peru, a chance sighting could lead to the discovery of a forgotten site high in the Andean Cordilleras. An exploratory dig or a flood could expose evidence of a town or even a previously unknown culture, remarkably hidden by rainforest. Like their counterparts in the cultures to the north, the Moche, the Chimu, the Inca peoples of Peru, apparently devoted a great deal of their time to construction and renewal of the public buildings that graced their cities and ceremonial centers. This is an ancient world. All right. Again, again, listen. This is an ancient world festooned with ruins and stone, some so grand as to foster folk legends that they were built by supernatural beings, others so delicately carved and pierced with open work that they appeared to float in their environment. Not far from present day Mexico City, the massive structures of Teotihuacan still attract tourists and scholars. An awesome religious complex that dates back to the first century before the Christian era and was built by peoples whose power and wealth were enshrined in legend by later generations of pre-Columbians. Tiahuanaco, its monumental stones, indicative of great and powerful culture, lie silent on the Bolivian Antiplano near Lake Titicaca. Confronted with these wonders, even the least imaginative of observers cannot help pausing to reflect and ask questions. What precisely were the religious concepts that motivated the construction of the huge temples and pyramids? Were these structures a source of pride for the commoner who helped quarry or haul the great slabs? Or were they symbols of authoritarian oppression? Did certain carved figures, which may strike us as frightening or grotesque, have that effect upon the men and women who apparently worshiped before them? Only slowly are archaeologists finding the answers to some of these questions. Others will probably never be answered because a key intellectual clue to an alien culture, the written record exists only in difficult to decipher fragments for some pre-Columbian civilizations, not at all for others. This situation is in vexing contrast to our experience with ancient cultures in the old world. So many tablets remain from summer that translators will be busy for decades, but the Inca most powerful of ancient American empires had no form of writing, nor did any other known South American culture. Right, so of course, you know, Dash the Hijack, there was definitely writing over here. Although Maya hieroglyphics still exist in great numbers on steles and buildings, hundreds of written codices were destroyed during the Spanish conquest. 
In recent years, many glyphs have been translated, but a great deal of scholarly detective work still needs to be done. The temptation is great, therefore, to invest in an ancient pre-Columbian monument with meaning from their, our own ex perspective. The governor's palace at Uxmal, for example, strikes a contemporary critic as elegant in style, its long low facade and exercise in symmetry. Experts agree that the ruins of Palenque, at least from our point of view, are the most graceful of Maya survivals, employing a style that is less ponderous, say, than that of the boldly soaring but heavily temple of the giant jaguar at Tikal. Such judgments are harmless, so long as we remember that we have no indication that the architects of pre-Columbian America thought in such terms. All we definitely know is that what we see, even physically, is not what a contemporary saw. Quite apart from the essential element of bustling crowds or hushed ritual groupings, most of the surviving stonework that pleases our taste for purity of line or truth to the material was, in fact, painted in bright colors or sheathed in gold. All right? You hear that? They had colors and they had gold, these buildings, hung with extravagant tapestries. And they had tapestries or roofed with elaborately plated glass, glass on the roofs. You hear this? The stone buildings of the Americas were obviously erected to last, and they were not in their day broken, silent remnants standing stark against the timeless sky. Perhaps the best way to understand the stonework of pre Columbia America is simply to look at the technique, for it is in every instance a tribute to ingenuity resourcefulness, dedicated labor, and most of all, patience. It was also fundamentally different from Western building tradition since the 2000 years of extensive building from approximately 500 BC to AD 1500 did not see the invention of the true arch, nor as it well known, the utilization of the wheel, which is doubtful we found the wheel here and all that in the arch. Nonetheless, as you will see on the following pages, pre-Columbian builders and craftsmen solved the practical problems of working in stone and used it for many purposes. The Inca, for example, had water and drainage systems that surpassed anything in medieval and renaissance Europe, and their stone-walled agricultural terraces were breadbaskets of sustenance and conquest. It was the skilled workmen in stone, too, who played a crucial role in what we would call the propaganda of the ruling aristocracy. I just wanted to show an example of they're talking about. So you see this temple, all right? And that had a roof and everything, as they're saying. You imagine that? This is looking from another temple down, right? Hieroglyphs everywhere, not a stone. It says here, an intricately carved stone doorway frame frames a view of the temple of the warriors at Chichen Itza, Yucatan. Once roofed over, the columns at the base may have enclosed a council room. You see that? The sculpted friezes of Maya structures show the ruling caste in their properly ordained place, sacrificing to the gods or dealing with prisoners of war. Inscriptions on stills, large freestanding stone slabs, glorify specific rulers by listing their dates and deeds. The faithful rendering of abstract geometric patterns though the literal reference of the design is unknown to us, seems to be emblematic of cultural identity and political power. The state was triumphantly incarnate in stone. S stone made possible the construction of permanent markers and observation platforms for celestial sightings, important for the study of the heavens to chart events in both the natural and supernatural worlds, closely bound together in the ancient Americas. The alliance between ancient astronomer and architect was closed in other ways. For reasons not yet understood, for example, many Mesoamerican ceremonial centers are aligned in the direction of 15 to 20 degrees east of true north. Other centers seem to be purposely aligned in some other direction. Moctezuma, the Aztec emperor, reportedly ordered entire building dismantled because it was not in alignment with sunrise at the equinoxes. Clearly, it was prudent for masters of stone to confer in advance with astronomers. 
Finally, the story of stonework in ancient Americas again, as we have seen often throughout this volume, a story of cooperative effort. The work may have been grim or festive, we do not know, but it was always rigorously organized. We certainly see that a truly unimaginable number of man hours went into the construction of the famed ancient centers. In the myth of desolation and ruin, we look back to the past, wrote Stevens, cleared away the gloomy forest and fancied every building perfect upon the imposing armor shores of civilization, bequeathed us by the ambiguous architects of ancient Americas. We may try to flesh out an imagined vision, but the message of the stones is perhaps the same as it was millennia ago. Power, unity, obeisance to spiritual. Awesome effort and a shared belief. In the high civilizations of ancient America, from Mexico to Peru, the state organizes citizenry for the building of massive pyramids, temples, and palaces. The sheer tonnage of earth removed, of rock transported and carved, of bricks dried in the sun, never fails to astound the observer. In Mexico alone, there may be as many as a hundred thousand pyramids, all right, just in Mexico alone, all right? Show me that in Africa, in one place, in one country. A hundred thousand just in Mexico. Still waiting to be uncovered. Still waiting to be uncovered. They're not they're not talking about the ones they already found. So this is a hundred thousand that have not been uncovered. The number of ceremonial centers shrouded by forests in other parts of Mesoamerica or inundated by the desert sands in Peru must surely be large. There's still so much all over Central America and South America. Volume is as astonishing as number. Mexico's Cholula Pyramid is the largest in the world. All right, we've gone over this. Largest, largest by mass, largest man, human construction on world world Guinness record, all right? Cholula. Atical, Guatemala, the tallest pyramid of the new world rises to 229 feet. But now we got actually one in Guatemala too, which is La Danta, El Mirador, which is taller than that. It's actually the tallest in the world. To produce such impressive monuments require not only innumerable man hours, but a shared community, belief, and almost all of the great structures of pre-Columbian times served a religious or political purpose. The pyramids were built as bases for temples, a possible attempt to make a connection between men on earth and the spirits of the unseen world. Perhaps to reinforce that idea, the great complexes seem to have been built with spatial relationships that have religious significance. These monuments did not stand unchanging, frozen once built. On the contrary, building seems to have been cyclic called succeeding generations adding their mark, often enclosing or superimposing their own structures on the works of their predecessors. All right, so we got an image here. You see these temples and pyramids. This is another part of it right here. It's like another side of it. So it's pretty big. big. And we're going to read right now how it was flattened. The below careful planning shows in the Zapotec religious center of Monte Alban, which occupies a spectacular hilltop site, painstakingly leveled some 2,000 years ago. Okay, this was leveled. Then up here tells us about Teotihuacan, Mexico. It says, required nearly a million tons of adobe for its 243-foot height, the Pyramid of the Sun, the Tambo in Teotihuacan making it larger in volume than Egypt's Great Pyramid of Giza. And then says the facade of the site's contemporary temple of Quetzalcoatl, far right, is decorated with alternative serpent heads and images of Google uh, goggled-eyed rain deity. So they're talking about Teotihuacan's pyramid, you see? All stone. You see how massive that is? Massive work. And then these decorations they're talking about in stone. An unexpected variety. In decoration wildly phantasmagoric deities 
convincingly naturalistic creatures of the forest, precisely repeated angular forms. The decorative stone sculptures of pre-Columbian cultures has finally come to be appreciated in all its unexpected variety thanks to continuing excavation and expert restoration. Certain styles of ornamentation are readily identifiable by period and civilization. Others show a myriad of influences. The word decorative has a particular meaning in this context. Whatever the fundamental aesthetic appeal of a stone mosaic facade or a wall covered with realistically writing serpents, the true function was likely to convey some message about the majesty and prestige of the state and its religion. The terrifying vengeful statues of Aztec gods were surely meant to impress the pilgrim, the captive or the ordinary citizen with the implacable power of their mighty empire. The strange carvings of Chavin combining the purely imaginary with the exotic conveyed a mystical meaning for the believer. Typically the Inca produced relatively little decorative stonework as if content to let the grandeur of their huge structure speak for itself. A 20th century observer lacks the key to understanding the message of most pre-Columbian carving. Indeed, only a fragment remains, but this remnant documents a surprising flexibility within a unified style. Alright, so some more images here. Some stonework. And these are very megalithic stoneworks. Not just any little bricks. Alright, and you see the designs. The intricate designs of the stone. Look at this. All right, let me just zoom in. Look, so you guys can take a look at this. Look at the rattlesnake or the Quetzalcoatl bird snake. It says that left a rich variety of late classic Maya style is expressed on the facade of the nunary quadri triangle of Uxmal, Yucatan, as boldly carved serpents undulate against repeated geometric forms. A nearby sail above a roughly contemporary carving shows a fantastic mask over a row of half uh, columns. Okay, look at that. This is another image, and this is the temple in Mitla. And look at the cross. And we just did a recent video on the cross, and here in ancient America and an ancient world, pre Christian has nothing to do with Christianity. And you'll find the symbol of the cross here in ancient America many times. And this is just an, one example of it. So I'm glad this came up. And look at that, the cross, you see? This is on the stone wall, right, of a temple. The famous mosaics at Mitla, a mystic city above, are actually chiseled stone plaques very precisely fitted to produce endless variations of the favorite mystic step key design. And uh, down here, all right, look at this. You see the arch? And it says that 20,000 dressed stones form the stunning mosaic frieze of the 322-foot-long governor's palace at Uxmal. Unfamiliar with the true arch, the Maya used a corbelled arch in the center. You see that? The true arch they're talking about. What if this is better? Massive stone works engineered with precision. Supreme in Peru for less than a century, the Inca, sometimes called the Romans of the New World, nevertheless built monuments that have rarely been surpassed for an awe inspiring bulk and precision of workmanship. So, again, that's talk that title's talking about something like this. And we've gone over uh, this place here. This is Saxawaman in Cusco, Peru. These are the three walls. The three walls, like Josephus it describes the three walls, this circle, the city of David. And you see how these stones are laid out precisely on top of each other. You can't even fit a knife there or a piece of paper. That's how precise it is. Okay, and they're huge, very heavy stones. Does the megalithic style of Inca masonry at Cusco's great fortress of Sacsayhuaman is shown at left below and in detail at right using stones as heavily as 200 tons as heavy as 200 tons this is what i'm saying it's very heavy look how big these are look how huge these are next to these children right there and precisely you can't fit anything in these lines that's how tight they are 
200 tons and as tall as 16 and a half feet, its 15th century builders made joints so tight that a knife cannot be forced between them. The enormous walls up to 1,500 feet long have withstood severe Andean earthquakes, unscathed, but many of the buildings within the fortified area were destroyed by Spanish conquerors to eliminate a native defensive position and obtain building materials. And this is another example. This is actually in Cusco. Some of the buildings there and the foundations of Cusco have this same uh, building technique. It says here below the sturdy polygonal lower walls of Hatun Rumiyuk, a vanished Inca palace in Cusco, features a famous example of Inca craftsmanship. The 12 corner stone in the right foreground, typically the walls incline slightly inward, adding aesthetic appeal as well as structural stability. The sharp contrast between precise fit and roughly textured surface was perhaps intended to emphasize the natural sculptural qualities of the individual stones. Look at that. Again, master builders. Conquering the mountains. Most Inca stonework, despite the romantic patina of age and legend through which we see it, was practical in nature. The lovely curved lines of agricultural terracing, for example, responded to the tremendous need for food of a state based on conquest. Huge stores of maize and other crops fed an army of, on the move or were warehoused against the frequent crop failures endemic to high altitude farming. Built of rough field stone, the terraces sometimes inclined up hills as steeply banked at 60 degrees and alleviated the two chief problems of agriculture in an area with a hard dry season. Thin soil and inadequate moisture. These artificial fields were constructed by carrying topsoil and gravel by hand from the richer bottomlands to create a level environment suitable for growing maize, a crop essential for the making of chicha, a corn beer used in Inca rituals and feasts. To protect this precious crop against drought, these terraces were often linked to elaborate canal systems. The most famous slopes of terraces at Pisac near Cusco, clearly produce more food than local villagers would need. Surpluses must have gone to the national granaries, with their irrigation ch channels, economical use of land. The terraces were functional, constructions were yet we can agree with the 19th century observer who wrote, no visitor can see them without being amazed at the skill, patience and power to which they bear, a silent but impressive testimony. All right, so we're going to show a couple images of what they're talking about. Some terraces here. The Stonewall farming terraces known as Andinis efficiently produce crops for the Inca state. Many of these intricately engineered fields, like those at 1100 foot high Pisac on the left, are four or more centuries old and are still in use today. All right, so people are still using them. So you see this one? This one's a good one. See these terraces to grow? They build this with stone. They did this all stone. They built this, and then they were growing on top of them. And they got the canals, the water. And we all know this famous picture, right? And if you don't know, this is uh, Machu Picchu, the city of, in a mountain, right high in the Andes Mountain. Machu Picchu was discovered very late. It says Machu Picchu above excites wonderment because of its dramatic, barely accessible Andean location. In the absence of any reference to it in early Spanish accounts, only rediscovered in 1911 and since reclaimed from forest overgrowth, its baths, drains, fountains, and administrative buildings attest to an exceptional building effort. It was probably a small but elaborate Inca town, seasonally used by the Cusco elite but occupied year long by their retainers and local farmers. So it was like a getaway huh? for their elite. Who are we talking about? Who's their elite? King David, Solomon, who are we talking about? Gets a coat. Highways that bound an empire. The sprawling Inca empire was ruled with exemplary efficiency in part because of a superb highway system that included intermittently paved roads up to 24 feet wide, tunnels, bridges, and stepped pathways cut into living rock, 
The principal Highland Road atop a spine of the Andes ran 3,450 miles. You, you guys hear this? From the Colombia Ecuador border to central Chile, lateral roads linked it to the coastal highway, about 1,000 miles shorter. When necessary, the roads were raced upon causeways across marshy land, once for eight miles, for eight miles. The thousands of bridges included pontoons, stone constructions using the core belt arch and rope bridges. This extraordinary communications network was almost exclusively for official use, military movements, transport of supplies, and messages brought by relay runners. These young men stationed in pairs along the highway about every two miles conveyed their messages at an estimated speed of about 150 miles a day. All right, these are your original male men. Occasionally, the luxury of fresh fish from the sea would be borne the 300 miles to Cusco. Spaced along the road were rest houses with food and other supplies for those traveling on official business. Ironically, the very road ways that made it possible for the Inca to control their vast empire, rapidly moving an army to quell a rebellion, were the avenue of the empire's downfall, given the Spanish conquistadors under Pizarro direct access to the heart of the kingdom. And here they just have an example, one of those ancient Inca roads, is, which most likely is might be even older than the Incas already there. And again, more examples. Again, these go for, again, 3,450 miles and possibly even more, you know, roads that they haven't found. All right, and you see the bridges. Some of them are still there or people just build new ones. It says literally breathtaking road bridges like this one spanning the canyon of the turbulent Apurimac River were crucial in the Inca road system. Today's villagers rebuild it annually using 22,000 feet of rope spun from grass. Wow, see? Exploiting water resources. So this is an example of what they were doing, manipulating water, creating islands, canals, irrigation systems. Uh, these are the, some of the images here. It says Mesoamerican skill in exploiting the available water supply took many forms. The aerial photo at right shows tra tracery remaining from irrigation canals and raised platform fields and marshland near Veracruz. Below right, a 19th century lithograph portrays a 400 foot deep natural well in the Yucatan. At left, the floating gardens near Mexico City are only remnants of vast agricultural islands built by the Aztec. Willows planted at the corners of a plot prevent erosion and mud dug from the canal enriches the soil. All right, this is what they're talking about. The ancient islands they had built, the floating islands. And look at this well, just a drawing. The celestial vision of ancient Americans. Ancient Americans lived close to the heavens. The night skies without artificial light were brilliantly clear. We know from surviving codices that wise men sat patiently, watching and calibrating the movements of the chief celestial objects and constellations, their observations made with the naked eye, and their calculations made by horizon sighting with simple cross-stick devices were astonishingly accurate. The Maya, for example, who could successfully predict solar eclipses, determined the seasonal year to an equivalent of 365.2420 days. Contemporary science calculates it at 365.2422. You see how precise the Maya were? Such precision required years of collecting data and relatively sophisticated mathematics. Why this concentration upon the stars? The sightings used to time planting and harvesting were also incorporated into a formal rigid religious system. Consequently, calendars kept time but also glorified the deities. Even the great Moctezuma was required to of offer incense to important stars. After dusk, at about 3 a.m., and immediately before dawn, most astronomical records from pre-Columbian times have been destroyed or lost but evidence being compiled by the new discipline of archaeoastronomy indicates that man strove hard to live with his life in harmony with the stars. 
So here we have one of the most uh, famous uh, observation towers built by the Maya. As you guys can see, goes around the doorways and the windows. So you guys can see every direction. So again, this observation tower is what they're saying down here. It says the Caracol left a Maya Toltec building at Chichen Itza. A a view of the flat Yucatan countryside that would have facilitated horizon sightings and probably served as an observatory. Its windows may have been aligned with certain celestial events. And this is in Tijuanaco, in Bolivia. This is here the gateway of the sun, Tijuanaco. Bolivia above is one of the most puzzling relics of unknown but obviously important pre-Columbian people. When figures in a staff god are carved on this single block of andesite in patterns suggestive of a calendar. All right, and I got a future video planned hopefully on this. Just trying to make sure I know what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, origin, possible origin of why this is here. And I know a lot of people go with the whole gate thing and all that, you know, Stargate. But um, yeah, it's a very interesting thing, right? And this is a building, I believe, in uh, Palenque. I believe I've seen this one. And li literally like on top of a mound. Of course, a stone. Yeah. Hey, everybody. So once again, thanks for tuning in and sticking around reading uh, these two books as we see in the screen here. Mysteries of Ancient Americas, The New World Before Columbus and Prehistoric Man in America by Dean Harris. Hope you guys enjoyed it the beautiful art, these ancient master builders, these ancient artisans, doctors and scientists here of ancient America, indigenous to this land, not from any other part, indigenous to this land, the true old world. You guys have a blessed uh, day. Much love and respect. Pura Vida. Hawaii.